When Amanda Catella started going to work with her father, who worked at the Boys and Girls Club of the Lower Naugatuck Valley in early 1990, I don't think she realized the impact that that club would have on her. Along the way, Amanda would learn many lessons at the Boys and Girls Club, but the biggest lesson was friendship. She met so many friends at the Boys and Girls Club. Friends from Derby, friends from Shelton, friends from Ansonia, friends from Seymour, friends from Monroe, and friends from Bridgeport. Amanda Catella decided that she wanted the club to be a big part of her life. Along the way, she was a member of the Torch Club program, the Keystone program, and she was also awarded Athlete of the Year, Junior Girl of the Year, and Girl of the Year in 2001. But it's not about awards for Amanda Catella. Sure, they are nice, but it's the lessons she learned while being a member of the Boys and Girls Club. She realized that she wanted to work with children as well. And as years went by, she became an educator and is now a guidance counselor in the Stratford school systems. Amanda would, tell, would be the first to tell you that if not for the Boys and Girls Club, she would not be the person she is today. She learned so much from being a part of the Boys and Girls Clubs. And if you ever have to wonder the impact they have on kids, just look at Amanda Catella. She has done tremendous things in her life, but being a member of the Boys and Girls Club is one of those things that she's enjoyed the most. Tonight on Hometown Heroes, we pay tribute to not only a legendary club member, but also a legendary person. For Hometown Heroes, I'm Mike Kenichi. Good evening everyone, I'm Mike Kenichi and welcome to another edition of Hometown Heroes. And we are delighted to have on with us longtime Boys and Girls Club member of the Lower Naugatuck Valley and now Hall of Famer, Amanda Catella. And Amanda, I wanna thank you for coming on today. It's an honor to have you, you know. I look back, Amanda, and I've probably watched you grow up. I think I met you when you were like four years old and to see you become the person you are today is amazing and I really do thank you for coming on today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. So Amanda, the story goes your father started working at the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, back then I think it was the Derby Shelton Boys and Girls Club and I want to say he probably came maybe 1982, 1983. Okay. Right. So I think um, you started going there when you were like four years old, I somewhere did. around there. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I became a club member when I was four and I wasn't technically supposed to be there until I was six right but my father would take me occasionally um, on Saturday and I would spend a lot of time with Ms. Schmecker in the ceramics room that's really the only room I was allowed to go in at the time right. but I, uh, I used to spend a lot of time with her there on Saturdays working on pieces of art <laughs> right now obviously you're very young at four years old but let me ask you this when your father told you you know you're gonna have to start going to the club were you for the club at the time? I mean, you were little, but I mean, some kids, they don't want to, you know, be at a place. They want to be able to go home after school. Did you want to, did you want to go to the club from the time, you know, your father basically started telling you about it and stuff? I think I did. I wanted to go, um, you know, I wanted to go because I wanted to spend time with my dad and like, you know, be there and be with other kids. And so I, I was pretty excited about going right. when I was younger. Right. Now, um, we all know about the the building tragically burnt down in 1991. I mean, how old were you at the time? Were you were maybe what six years old at the time? Uh, yeah, five. Yeah, five, right? So, I mean, did you even really understand what was happening? And I mean, how tough was that for your father? Because I mean, that was basically his whole life, and to see that happen, that had to be a tough time for him. Yes, for me. Um 
you know, when the club burned down, it, I didn't, I don't think I really understood at the time, you know, because right. I was so young, but over the years I was able to understand what that really meant because, you know, remember, I know you were there too. And all of the, the little subcontracted clubs that came after that big yes. building. So back in 1991, the, the boys club had this wonderful, big, um, huge place for kids to go after school and, and hang out. And then, you know, from that burning down, they always kept the doors open, but the club, you know, was a lot smaller and they lost membership at the time and they, but they were still running, you know, activities in those smaller clubs and trying to raise money to have the clubhouse right. that they have now. I think during that time, I really understood what that meant for my dad and, you know, having to, having to spend all of the time, um, you know, fundraising and getting things going so that the kids can have another a place to go again. Right. And, you know, the thing about your father, which, you know, we've always loved about him is he never ever, if something's bothering him, you, he never shows it. You're not going to see it. But I mean, it had to be difficult for him, you know, at least for a good five years trying to get this building up and running, having to go through everything they did. I mean, it could not have been easy for him. How did he handle everything? Um, well, you know, my dad's kind of that. He's a quiet hero, too. Like you said, he he doesn't really let a lot show. Um, even at home, he doesn't. I know he speaks a lot to my mother. You know, she's kind of his, his rock behind. Right. Um, you know, I think he does it because it's his passion. Do you know what I mean? And right. I understand that now, too, um, as an adult. And I think it did take a lot, but it's always about the kids for my father. And I remember him saying that since uh, right. I was a little girl. So I, I think that that's probably how he handled it is because he had a vision on what he wanted. Right. And, you know, he was going to get it for those kids. Right. Now we'll get into this a little more, but you and your brother start going there, your brother, Mikey. I mean, your father, when he's at the Boys and Girls Club, he can't necessarily be dad. He has to, you know, treat you two the same way he would treat any other member. I mean, was it something that he told you up front that when I'm at work, you know, you have to follow the rules like every club member? I mean, how was it for him to separate the two for you? Hmm. I don't think we ever had that conversation um, about about the club and, and home and things being different. Um, I think it was just understood that I needed to follow the rules, whether I was at my house or at the club. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> but... The role itself was difficult for, for me. Um, and the reason was is because I think a lot of people, like growing up, I remember people thinking that it was easier for me because my father was the director and that, you know, right. I was there. And I think for me it was a little bit more challenging because my father was there every day. I mean, you know, right. all the other kids were getting a place to get away from their parents and my father was, was watching every, you know, everything. And kids sometimes, you know, like boys didn't want to like me and g girls, you know, right. didn't always want to connect with me because my father did, you know, have this role. So um, I think he tried to be fair to me along the way and, and allow me to have the same experience that all the other kids were having, but at the same time, you know, it wasn't always easy having right. <laughs> having your dad there where people, f I think, felt the opposite, like it was easier. Right. Now, you had talked about uh, Mrs. Schmecker's uh, ceramic room. You know, of course, we're talking about Mary Schmecker. I think she spent 35 years at the Boys and Girls Club. Oh, yeah. So that was basically your first counselor, you know, and it's hard to look at her as a counselor because she's a larger-than-life person, but basically your first counselor, counselor that you had interaction with um, explain the relationship with her and what she meant to you as a, you know, role model. Oh, wow. Um, so Mary Schmecker, she, like I said, she ran, uh, the ceramics room at the time. And that was the first room that I was ever like allowed right. to be in at the club. Mrs. Schmecker is just an amazing woman. She was older, um, but what a wonderful role model she she really was. She was always there to listen. Um, she loves me. She allowed me to be in her room. Right. I wasn't coloring. I wasn't painting in the lines or anything. But you know, she still made me feel like everything that I did in her room was the best thing that right. you know ever that ever existed. In um, one thing that really stands out with Mary Schmecker for me is that she gave me my first award at the club. I wasn't old oh, enough nice. to even be there. And I remember at one of the awards nights, because I always spent time in her room, you know, she had printed me out a certificate. Right. And, uh, and I, I was able to get my, my award. And it, to me, that meant the world at the time. Like, wow, you know, I'm five right. years old and I'm getting this, this award at, you know, so 
Mary Schmecker, she's she's wonderful, and to me, she meant a real lot. She was one of the first role models I had at the club. Right, and you know, you were talking about your father, always about the kids. It was the same thing with uh, Mary Schmecker. I mean, she was always about the kids. I mean, you would see that lady make it in a snowstorm just so she could, you know, interact with the kids, and they love ceramics just to be there for them. And I mean, that's really, you know, when you talk about boys and girls clubs, that's the type of things people don't see is what the people do behind the scenes. And I mean, she was just a good hearted, caring person who really cared about the kids. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so now, what would you say was your first year, how old were you the first time you started going um, steadily at the Boys and Girls Club? Well, probably six. Like I was already going when I was four, six right. or seven. Right, now mm -hmm. did you, you had grew up in Bridgeport, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, you couldn't make it to the club every day, obviously, but I'm sure, like, if I had to guess, your first real um, interaction at the club was summer camp, you three know, Saints going Park. to Three Saints Park. Uh, you know, I always felt those were the best summer camps at the Boys and Girls Club. Um, what was your – describe your time there at Three Saints Park, what that was like for oh you. Oh, God. Three Saints Park was the best. It was the best. I can't even tell you the amount of friends that I made, you know, going to Three Saints Park and friends that I stayed friends with all year, you know, even after summer camp. Um, but it was definitely my favorite moments at the club was going to Three Saints Park for a long time. And I think the reason why I love Three Saints Park was because – um, it was just the place that we can be ourselves and, you know, do right. the things that kids wanted to do all summer. I don't know. You probably remember that we would practice for the talent show oh, starting yeah, like yeah. day one of summer camp. But I made so many good friends there. Some of them I'm still friends with now, you know, Teddy Beersley, Louis Dorenzo. Right. Um, both of which I'm still on Facebook with. Louis, I meet up with every once in a while. Teddy moved to Maryland. But, you know, those relationships that were built during that time was, you know, right. amazing. You know, the. the the thing about summer camp, too, is you meet so many different people. You know, there's different staff members at summer camp. You, you have some of the same, but then you get new ones who are there. And then there's different kids that you meet along the way. So, I mean, you got to be friends with people from Shelton, people from Derby, people from Ansonia, yeah. Bridgeport. Um, I'm sure Monroe, you probably got a few people. So, I mean, that to me is the thing you get out of the club the most is the friendships that you were able to make. Absolutely. Um, like I said, a lot of the kids and a lot of people that I've met through the club, whether even counselors that I've met at the club, like they're still here. It's, you right. know, I'm 30 years old now. And, and these are people that you don't hesitate to make phone calls to, whether it's just to talk. Like I said, you know, if I call Lewis up, it's never like, oh, I haven't talked to you in five years. It's like, hey, how are right. you? You know, that bond is really strong. Um, the same thing with the counselors. If I, you know, call and ask for a letter of recommendation or anything, it's it's with open arms. It's never, um, uh, it's it's always a positive, positive relationship that you've built. I built with all of the people there. Right, and you know, you, you're talking about counselors. I mean, it's got to make you re feel real important when, to this day, you're 30 years old, and every time your birthday comes, you know, a certain counselor will send you a birthday card, and I mean. Right here I have, uh, all right, where is it? Oh, it's actually over here. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Right here is a card, and it's from a longtime staff member, Billy Bradley. Mm -hmm. I mean, how does that make you feel as a former club member to know that somebody took the time, a counselor? Because that just shows that these people cared about you. They didn't just care about getting paid and stuff like that. They actually cared about you, the person, as well. Yeah, the interesting thing about Billy Bradley is that – I, I have received a card every single year from him and I right. have not talked to him in years. And the thing like he still remembers, you know, when my birthday is or cares enough about me to send me a card and say, hey, right. you know, I'm thinking about you. I still remember you in my life. Like that's, it's amazing to me. It really is. Right. You know, one of the things too, Amanda, some kids are fortunate to have things, but there's other kids who don't have a lot of things. So the club was that place where not only would they have people that cared about them, but they also got to do things that they may not have been able to do if not for the club. You know, a couple of things are, you know, trips to Lake Quasi, trips to Yankee Stadium. You know, that's the type of stuff the club was able to provide for these kids. And otherwise, they may not have been able to experience those things. Absolutely. Um, 
I probably, but you know, for me anyways, I probably would have been able to experience a lot of those things because, you know, just my family life um, is good and, and my parents probably would have taken me. But um, for me, the things that I got from the club that I probably would not have gotten, you know, if I had not gone there, you're absolutely right for other kids, yes, um, there were opportunities. The opportunities for me was definitely being a part of Keystone Club because those, right. you know, Keystone Club, I, I mean, it's a youth leadership group. Um, and you raise, you do fundraising and community service to be able to attend trips and the trips that I've gotten to go on and all of the other kids right. that were in the Keystone Club with me are things and experiences that I would never would have had. Right. Um, and going on the conference itself and, um, you know, going through the workshops that were available at the time and then the social events at night were just experiences right. of a lifetime that even now I've never experienced anything like that. It's not just like going on vacation. It's a forum. It's, you know, um, so that experience was definitely one that um, I treasure in my life and I know had molded me a lot. Right. And, you know, your brother and you, you know, started going to the club and little by little, you kind of, you both kind of, kind of uh, brought more family members to the club. You know, you'd see a lot of them in the summer. So, I mean, the club wasn't just like, you know, for your friends, it was for your family too. I mean, there were other people that you brought into that building, which I really thought was, you know, remarkable. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, I think your cousin Jamie, Kaidi, um, Adan, you know, I'm probably Gina. missing a couple. Yeah. yeah, Gina, a couple people. And, and, you know, a lot of these people that you brought in, family members, probably maybe looked at the club at first and weren't sure they wanted to go there, maybe didn't want to come back the next day. But little by little, they started to really enjoy the experience there, and they loved the club probably as much as you did. Oh, you yeah. know, I mean, it was definitely an experience. Now, um, you brought up Keystone, and we'll get to that more, but I believe the first um, youth leadership group that you joined was the Torch Club, and oh, yeah. I believe that was around 1997, 98. Yeah. Um, talk about Torch Club and what how that prepared you for keystone oh, okay so torch club is is um another youth leadership group it's it's the program that happens before the keystone for the younger age group right um i think it's is it 11 to 13 and then from 14 to 18 you advance on into the keystone am i right with the ages right I know. right okay um so torch club is the same type of thing you know you raise money you d and and through the fundraising though you develop a lot of skills because you're saving money you're you're showing up for right. things you have to be there um it's a commitment to a group oh yeah and definitely. so uh torch club even you know in, in keystone you get to go on two uh conferences a year and torch club was one at the time but it does prepare you you know you you begin doing things in the community at the time torch club was run by jimmy queen right um when i was doing it and you know we would do things in the community and we would you know save money to go on on conferences as well so torch club has definitely set the foundation and being a part of the torch club i was like oh i'm definitely gonna get into the keystone right. club when i turn 14 i'm gonna definitely do that now they so. Did you join Torch Club right when you were 11? And how many years were you in it for all three, pretty yeah, much? Yes. Right. And you know, the thing, the difference between now and Torch Club, as opposed to back then, is the numbers weren't there back then because, again, the club didn't have its own building. So, you, you know, not a lot of members came. So basically, you guys really had to hustle and work hard to make, you know, each uh, event that you needed to make to make the trip, stuff like that. And I believe you guys, didn't you guys go to Boston for a weekend one year for Torch Club? Yeah. Yeah, talk about that a little bit in that experience. Oh, it was uh, probably one of my first times away from home without my parents. Um, we went to Boston. Oh, I remember we would, we saw a lot of things like the Boston Tea Party, things that I hadn't yet seen. Right. Um, and just the trip itself being on the conference being around other club members um you know getting to be with the kids that you worked hard with to get on this trip during that time the friendships the biggest part i mean you learn a lot of things about how to be a leader and, and all of these things that don't click at the time you know you hear them right. and you hear them again and again and you hear them through the keystone experience again and again and right. eventually as an adult you're like wow you know all of that makes a huge difference but definitely when you're there as a kid you remember the moment the friends right you know the, the role models that are there uh your chaperones and your in your advisors right. and things like that so i know that that's what stands out for me like you know just the friendships and the, the memories of that trip
Right. And I, if I'm not mistaken, in 1998, I think maybe it was your second year, maybe your third year there, you decided to run for Torch Club president, correct? Yes. And let me ask you, did you think a year before that that you would ever run for an officer's position? Or do you think that year in Torch Club helped you gain the confidence to be able to take that next step and go for an officer's position? Hmm. Well, probably so, yeah. I, uh, I think being in Torch Club for, for the first two years helped me gain the confidence to be able to do that. Um, you know, right. to think that I, that I had enough to be able to lead the, the group and uh, do the things that were necessary to get on the trips and, right. um, and help them in that way. So, yeah. Right. And, you know, to go for a position like that, you have to stand up in front of kids and tell them why you think you should be that position. Let me ask you this. How much did Torch Club play in your public speaking? Did it play a role or would that happen more as you went to Keystone? Um, well, I think that, I, you know, if I'm if I'm thinking right, I don't believe there was many opportunities other than that in Torch Club to, you know, speak in public. Definitely when I got to Keystone in the Meet the Kids night. That, that and I'm definitely, you know that I'm not afraid to speak in public and I right. have, you know, that skill. And I think that that was something that came a little bit, you know, more with the Keystone Club. But it began at Torch Club when, you're right, you know, we did have to prepare a speech, write a speech, talk about our skills and how we would be able to lead this group. And, um, you know, and you're running against people too, you know. Right. So um, why would my leadership be different than so-and-so's and, and um I think that that was important, having that skill as a, as a 13 year old, you know, just right. even having the opportunity to be able to, you know, speak to anybody about why I would be the one to lead a group uh, exactly. is an experience for a 13 year old. Yeah. Right. You know, Amanda, you have a unique relationship with your older brother, Mikey, who, yes. you know, is also a longtime club member, also a Hall of Famer, and he's won several awards, Boy of the Year, you know, just to name one. The relationship you had with him, you know, you two always kind of looked out for each other. And, you know, I think he was like a best friend to you as you were a best friend to him. Talk about your relationship with your brother, Mikey, not just, you know, outside the club, but also inside the club. Oh, yeah. So me and my brother um, were not too far apart in age. And I think both of us, you know, experienced our club uh, experience together. Right. Um, you know, we were off a little bit in age, but there were times that we were attended Keystone trips together because our age is close enough. Right. Um, my brother, he's, he's an outstanding person and, and something that came from the club with both of us. And I know we're going to touch on it a little bit later is that both of our professions are driven by, by children and working with children. And I know that right. that's because of, you know, the experience that we both had at the club and wanting to be what other people have been to us, right. you know, to other k kids. And, you know, for me, my relationship with my brother, um, he's just, he's always been there. He's always been there for me, you know, to listen, to, um, you know, to do fun things with in the club or outside of the club. But my brother, uh, you know, he, he would always be there if I needed somebody. And, and that right. is important. Definitely. And, you know, you talked about uh, earlier, you touched base on it, people like uh, Teddy Beardsley and Louis Dorenzo. Um, explain or, you know, talk about the relationships. Was there one particular person or a couple kids that you definitely, like, had a big time um, relationship with that helped you through your years at the club and got you through some of the tougher times? I mean, there's a lot of members. I mean, you can't think of them all, but I definitely yeah. think there had to be quite a few. Yeah. So, you know, there were there were kids. I was really close with Edwin um, when I was attending the club, and he won Boy of the Year the year that right. I won Girl Edwin, of the Year. Edwin uh, Figueroa. Figueroa, yeah. Yeah. absolutely. Um, but I gotta tell you, you know, if I had to, if I had to pick somebody who really, really led my future decisions, it, it was Shay right. and Jeff in the teen room. And I know um, they were counselors at the time. I think, you know, even me and Shay now were not too, too far apart in age. Um, what were ten years, maybe? Right. Um, but every experience, everything that I went through in high school, I remember coming back to Shay and talking to her about it in the teen room and, right. you know, sitting there and telling her, you know, oh, this happened, like, you know, and she would always listen. So it was, she was probably like my favorite friend right. <laughs> at the club, you know, especially in my later years there. Right. 
So now um, you talked about being Torch Club president. I believe you received a big honor at the club in, I want to say, 1999 maybe. And if I'm off, I apologize. But uh, you were awarded the uh, Junior Girl of the Year. Um, yeah. yeah. Talk about what that felt like when you heard your name. Because, you know, what people don't understand it's not easy when your father's running the building, you know, because people are always going to question things and stuff like that. But, I mean, it must have been a thrill for you, you know, a big honor to know that you worked hard for something and you were able to do it, you know, and you did it by yourself. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think, it. yeah, it always does raise the question, you know, did she get that award? Because her father runs the club. Right. Um, but when I have even now, like looking at the kids that are receiving these awards, I was all of those things that those kids were, you know, I participated in every right. program and um, a lot of, they were earned, you know. And, it's, and, and it's, it's very unfair for anybody to be, you know, labeled like that or classified like that, because at the end of the day, you're going there trying to do the same things that all the club members are trying to do. You're trying to raise money for your Keystone trip. You're trying to raise money for your Torch Club trip. You're trying to do better with your homework, schoolwork, stuff like that. So you're doing everything, and it's really unfair when people sometimes, you know, stereotype you like that. Absolutely, absolutely. But, you know, going back to your question before about receiving the actual award, um, I think the awards, receiving the awards was the experience of it was that I was allowed to see myself in a successful place, you know, being successful, working right. hard at something and then receiving, you know, a recognition about it. And I think that, um, you know, that helps you feel like I can do this, you know, and that's part of what the club does. And it, and it raises kids that feel like they can achieve. And I think that when I when I received the Junior Girl of the Year Award and some of the other awards that I think were really special to me. Um, right. That, that's the feeling that you get like, wow, you know, if I put in the work, if I work hard at something, I can actually be successful. Right. Now, let me ask you this. Did you have an idea? You know, when you're 10 years old, it's hard for anybody to think that these are going through your head. You're just a young kid. You're not looking ahead. You're just looking, you know, to today. But let me ask you this. Did you think at some point you were going to continue on at the club or did you think there was going to come a point where you said, you know what? I'm 12 years old now, or I'm 14 years old now. I kind of want to do something else. I don't want to be here every day. How? What was the goal for Amanda Catello when it came to the Boys and Girls Club as you got older? I never thought I was going to leave. <laughs> no. No, I never really wanted to leave. Um, right. I knew that for sure I'd be there through 18. At least, you know, I didn't know if I would get a job. I ended up getting a job at the club. So, you know, if I had a different job um, and not worked at the club, I might have been there less, but I think I would have still been there. You right. know, um, I, I might not have been there every single day after school, but I, I definitely would have gone to some of the social events and still, still been a part of Keystone. Right. Um, I, I don't think leaving, even as an adult, I was wondering, you know, when am I going to leave here? <laughs> you know, you don't want to leave. It's it's a good place right. to be. And I don't think that leaving was ever a thought of mine as a, as a kid. Right. And... Um... <clears throat> Let me ask you this. I think uh, when you got to maybe seventh or eighth grade, I want to say seventh grade, you had moved from Bridgeport to Orange now. So you started going to a new uh, junior high school. You had to meet new friends, stuff like that. I know, you know, we kind of talked about it off air a little bit, but it was not an easy transition for you when you moved to Orange. Would you say the club helped you a lot in getting through some of those difficult times back then? Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, it wasn't easy at the time. And I know, like, you had had some rough moments because, you know, it was a new school and you're trying to fit in, you're trying to be accepted. But, you know, you got through that great. And I think, like, you know, I would say the club helped you tremendously with that. I did have a hard time when I moved in. And, you know, now looking back on it, I'm not 100% sure why I think it might have been twofold. Like, you know, my my own my own brain wasn't as accepting about the move in right. addition to the kids maybe not accepting me a little bit at the time. Um, I just didn't feel like I belonged there. And I don't know why. Um, right. You know, I played on the basketball team there, and I, I just wasn't – I just didn't feel it. And maybe it could have been the difference in economy, like, from where I had come from, and then now I'm in this affluent town in this affluent school. 
I remember talking to my mom and, you know, telling her, Mom, you know, I need to get these Abercrombie jeans or, like, these swish pants at the time that had Abercrombie written down the leg. Right. And I, my mom was like, well, how much are they? And I'm like, oh, well, they're, like, 70 bucks. And my mom's like, absolutely not. Like, I'm not getting you those. And I'm like, but you don't understand. Like, I need them. Right. And my mom was like, no, no, you're not getting those. But I think, you know, being a club member at that time where I really didn't feel accepted for whatever reason at school and I and I and I being at the club where I did feel accepted helped you know I felt right. like I had friends there like genuine friends and it made me not feel so alone at a time where I really did feel alone you know seventh and eighth grade right because you know when you're a kid like that and you're going through all those emotions and stuff like that it's not easy to just forget about it but would you say going to the club afterwards and seeing your friends who you've been friends with forever definitely helped, you know, ease the pain of like, you know, going through everything you were going through at that time? Oh, yeah, absolutely did. It right. Absolutely did. Right. Definitely. Now, you mentioned uh, playing basketball. Um, let's talk about this a little bit because <laughs> this is pretty neat. Um, I want to say this was... Um, was this your freshman year? What year was this? This is 2001, so probably your sophomore, sophomore year. year. Yep. Yeah, let me ask you, um, this is pretty cool, 17-5 and five record. And we all know your father was an outstanding basketball player at Shelton High. Then he moved on to Eastern State, Connecticut, and he was tremendous there. When did Amanda Catella start getting into basketball? Okay, so... Well, I remember this very clearly. My mom, my brother was playing basketball in a league. I think it was the Hornets, the name of the team. And my mom was like, well, I'm going to sign you up for cheerleading so you could cheerlead for your brother's basketball team. So we right. did it. And um, I felt very uncomfortable as a cheerleader. I just wanted to be in the game. And I would sit on the end of the bench, you know, when I was supposed to be cheering, watching, right. kind of like looking and thinking like, oh, I want to be in there. Like, I want to play. Right. <laughs> and so... Um, I told my dad and then I started to practice and you know he signed me up for basketball and I started playing basketball um, but I developed my skills at the club I remember right. developing a lot of my skills at the club because you know and I can remember just times when there would be like you know sometimes playing with other kids in the gym after school but sometimes even when the gym was empty and just like shooting layup in each hoop like around you know right. and going around like 50 times and making layups right-handed layups and going the opposite way and doing left-handed layups and you know really developing my skills as a basketball player just right. you know from being at the boys club exactly and i know you're a big new york knicks fan but and your father's been forever you know me and your father for years have kind of had a friendly bet i'm a celtics fan he's a knicks fan and you know i've pretty much beat him a lot and gotten a lot of lunches from him but <laughs> would you say as a kid you watched basketball or did you just like playing it more than watching it like were you a big Knicks fan when you were a kid or were you a big fan of the Yukon women things um, well I it was always on because my father just doesn't watch anything else it's either sports or sports commentators on television right. so the games were always on and we were always fans you know the Yankees and the Knicks and my father took me to games too so I think I was a right. fan to a certain degree but I didn't watch every single game um, I think I was more of a player you know at right. that time yeah so I mean would you say though once you started playing more you got in like were there any players you kind of idolized watching you know Oh. I mean, being a Knicks fan, I'm sure you were a big Patrick Ewan fan. Or... Oh, yeah, and John Stark. Right. Um, but I think I really like Sue Bird. When yes. I, and I and it's because Great I went player. to the UConn camp when I was younger. I got to go to a UConn basketball camp with some of the girls from my high school. And, right. um, like, she was there. And I remember just really liking her. Uh, Great player. Yeah. Real good. Yeah. What, um, let me ask you this. Um, you talk about you know, playing at the club all the time. Now, your father being as knowledgeable as he is in basketball, um, did he work with you a lot too, like outside the club? I mean, would he take you to wherever the park and stuff like that, work on your game? I mean, he doesn't seem like the type of guy that would push you, like he's not that type of person, but I mean, did he definitely work with you a lot on your game and things of that nature? Yeah, well, you know, what was funny is you talk about the relationship that I have with my brother. My brother, like you said, my father never pushed me to play basketball. It was right. me. Like, I wanted to play. I wanted to, maybe I wanted to be like him. Maybe I wanted to be like my brother a little bit who was already playing, too. Right. Um, 
you know, was always around in our house too. I told you, you know, we're big sports people, particularly right. basketball. Um, but that relationship with my brother, I do remember my father would take us a lot and we would play each other. And of course my brother would always win. Um, <laughs> I remember him, like he would drive, drop us off at the end of the street and have two basketballs in his car and we would race each other down to our house. Oh, wow. Uh, so like That's dribbling the neat. balls, like we would have right. to dribble the balls and stuff. So we did fun stuff like that. And I think my brother and I played a lot and my father, um, he took us to play and then me and my brother would play against each other <laughs> right and you know um thing about that too is uh your brother loved playing sports as you mentioned you know one of the things the Catellas were famous for was every christmas you know day they were up in madison square garden watching the knicks play somebody yeah. the knicks always <laughs> seemed to play on christmas day and you know i remember your father saying one time that the best christmas he ever had was watching the knicks play the bulls i believe um I mean, that's how big sports has been a part of your family as well. So, I mean, you can't help but kind of be a fan because you kind of, you know, were born into it more or less. Absolutely. It is, it's crazy. You know, I, I, again, you feel the sense of accomplishment because when I, when I went to Shaw in high school my freshman year, you know, I, I got on the team. I made the junior varsity team, and I worked into making my varsity uh earning the varsity jersey by the end of my freshman year so probably the you know the last month of the season I had my varsity jersey as well and I would you know sit on all three benches and as awesome as that experience was you know I made some of my best friends even one of my best friends now is um you know somebody that I met on the team Stevie right. Belichick yep she lives in California very we still smart talk. I just too. talked to her the other yeah. day oh she's yeah. yeah intelligent I mean real smart kid um and I and you talk about that team you know, your freshman year, you had a coach who he had been known for football. That was his passion in uh, Chris Anderson. And I mean, wow. what was it like? I mean, you guys got an education, I'm sure, that first <laughs> year as high school, you know, girls playing for Coach Anderson, correct? Tell me, you know, that experience. That had to be awesome. I got to tell you, my freshman year was by far my favorite year um, playing. Right. It was by far, and it was all because Chris Anderson was the coach. And you're absolutely right. His background was to be a football player, and you know, and we needed a freshman girls basketball coach. And he just took the job with open arms. And right. even though it wasn't per se his thing, you know, teenage girls and basketball, and, and right. it was totally different than the boys in football. Um, but the experience of playing on that team was unreal. It was unreal until this day, I'll never, like, I think the world of Chris Anderson. And a lot of it was, you know, he was he was crazy, but it was a good crazy, you know? Right. He would he would get the gym at the boys club at eight o'clock in the morning to play, to practice on a Sunday before a big game that we had. And right. our varsity team didn't have practice. And you know, you hate him at the time. You're like, why do we have to get up right. and, and go to the club to um, practice at eight o'clock in the morning? And he's like, yep, because that's when the gym's available and you guys are gonna run. And we ran and we practiced and we learned our plays and went over things. And he would say, you know why you guys are gonna win? you're gonna win today because because you're the only freshman team in the country practicing right now. And, right. and we would be there and we won a lot more games than we should have that year. You know, we weren't the best team as right. a freshman team, um, <coughs> but we worked hard and a lot of it was because of, of Chris Anderson and all of his techniques and everything. Right, and I'm sure he's <laughs> a motivator. So, I mean, you, you're motivated to go out there. I mean, you wanna do good for him as well as yourself but i mean he definitely he he's one of the best motivators i've ever seen you know oh my god we had playbooks yeah playbooks scout he scouted freshman players for us it was yeah. un the experience like you know at the time you're like wow this is fun and um you know he created an experience for us to really bond with the girls on the team and to right. win and to you know lose together and we did all of this together but um i i remember like he would bring Wheaties, like these little things, things that I used in like when I became a coach at one point, but bring right. like Wheaties and we would all be eating the Wheaties and he'd be like, you're going to win. You're eating the breakfast of champions. Um, he would put on a jersey. I remember we played Brantford and the best player was, uh, I don't remember what her name was, but I remember she was 21 because Chris put on a jersey and put 21 on the jersey huge and yeah. went around practice like a maniac and was like, everywhere I go, you go. And he was like, get, you know, get me, get me. And so like he was, 
an animal in practice that day, but you know, we did. When the game came around and it was time to find that player, that girl was never not guarded. And it was because of all the motivation right. and all the practice. And he would do things that are a little unorthodox, but at the same time, you know, really created, you know, bonds between everybody on the team right. and made everybody want to work hard and made us really want to be there, you know? And, you know, I think uh, the best thing you said is, it was your favorite year of playing high school basketball. So that tells you that as you know, unorthodox as he was, as bizarre as he was, Maybe he best. made a difference and an impact on you because that was your favorite year. So, I mean, that says, that says a lot about him, the person as well. Mm -hmm. And I also really liked, um, you know, playing, playing varsity basketball was cool and it was good, but I also really loved to play on the LMV travel team. It was the a my AAU team. Um, right. And that was run out of the boys club by Ray Queen. Uh, yeah. And that was a big uh, experience in my in my club experience as well. It helped prepare me for my varsity season. Right. Um, it was a lot of games, a lot of practices. And he's uh, another guy who pushes people. Oh, I mean, yeah. he's definitely, he's not afraid to, you know, be blunt. He, you know, he feels that's the way to make you better. And I mean, he's been coaching probably 35 years as well. And the commitment to, you know, for us, it's a commitment as players. And he's been doing it for 35 years. But, you know, I, I played on his team for maybe four or five years. But, you know, that weekend, every weekend, yeah. it's two games a week, you know, a day. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of sacrifice, a sacrifice. lot of commitment. You know, you have to really be, you know, all in or it's, you know, but that's what makes everybody better. Definitely. It did. Absolutely. So now let's get into your freshman year of high school. We talked a little bit about it with the basketball, but let's talk about, you know, the Boys and Girls Club of the Lower Naugatuck Valley. You joined Keystone for the first time, and if I'm not mistaken, that was really Shea's first full year, Shea Roscoe, running Keystone. You know, I think the year before that, your father kind of like let her shadow him a little bit, mm -hmm. but this was like her first year of running Keystone. What was the Keystone experience like? You know, I mean, were you ready for it? I mean... What would you say it was like? I was ready for it. Um, right. Yeah, Torch Club prepares you for Keystone, and you kind of walk right into it. I wasn't ready for the leadership role of it yet, though. Right. Um, that came, you know, in my later teenage years, being in the club. But um, I was definitely ready for it. I wanted to do it. You know, I wanted to be in the teen room. I wanted to attend the meetings. I wanted to go on these conferences that my brother and father used to go on. And, right. Um, I absolutely was just, you know, ready to open with open arms for that experience. Right. Now let's talk about uh, some, you talked about conferences. What was your first big conference you went on in Keystone? Now this is where things get foggy for me because I remember them all, but the order of them, <laughs> I'm not 100% sure. Right. I, I, my favorite one that I can remember the biggest conference for me was um, in California. Right. We went to California, went to Disneyland um, as one of the social events. Uh, I remember that at this conference, Normally, like you would sign up for breakout sessions so you can do like two in the morning, have lunch, do two in the afternoon, and then right. you would have dinner and go to listen to a, a big keynote speaker. Everybody would come together at that point, listen to a keynote speaker, and then you would have your social event, whatever that is at night, a dance. Right. Uh, th this one was going to uh, Disneyland. I remember that this trip, I decided to do something different than attend the breakout sessions. And I did an off-site experience, which was <coughs> the first time that, like, I ever did an off-site one. Right. And this one was to go to, like, one of the veteran centers around, that was around in, in the area. And we would just go and, and we talked with veterans all day long. And that experience was amazing for me. Like, that was my favorite out right. of anything, I remember that. I remember talking to all these old men about their lives and their experiences, and it, it gave me a different opportunity, and I love that. I love the going on that trip to California. Right. Now, it's got to be, I mean, an unbelievable experience, though, to see so many other boys and girls clubs, and you make friendships. I mean, you know, you think about it, if you guys had social media back in 2001, oh, yeah. I'm sure you know, you would have had so many more relationships because you could have, it was hard to keep in touch back then. Really, all you had was email. So, I mean, just meeting different people from different clubs, you know, speakers, things of that nature. I mean, that had to be unbelievable. Oh, yeah. Um, there's a there's more than a thousand kids sitting in a room. I'm not sure exactly how many attend a Keystone conference, but it is 
a huge conference room filled with kids who have all earned their way uh, to attend a youth leadership conference and all there with a positive vibe and attitude and there right. is no experience that I think a 14 year old can experience that is anything like that you know right being away from home having fun with your friends seeing everybody else who um is there for the common good like a good purpose you know right so and you know i talked about it earlier but raising money i i, I a lot of people think that is an easy thing to do that is the most difficult thing because you're talking about for those trips you got to raise sometimes eight hundred dollars you know you know, at times 600, but a lot of times it's close to a thousand and it's not easy to ask people for money. You know, you have to do different things. I think you guys have done bowl oh, yeah. You guys have, uh, you know, canned outside, you know, different supermarkets to try to, um, raise money for the trip. So, I mean, all that goes into that, it's gotta be worth it when you have a conference, like you just said, you know, it, all the hard work because it's not, you know, there's times you probably want to rip your hair out. It had to be worth it all in the end. It does send a good message. Hey, work hard and here's your reward. You know, you get right. this wonderful experience at the end of all of this hard work because it is hard work to get on the trip. It's not an easy right. task. And there's even more to it than the fundraising because I remember there were certain activities that we must attend. You had to do a certain amount of community service to get on this trip. You had to, um, you know, make the money. So if you just show up for one fundraising event but not the others and you're short in your account, um, you're not going on the trip. So it, it was, it's a commitment. It's the commitment right. and working hard to get there. I remember the things that really stood out for me um, as far as fundraising go is selling a lot of candy for sure. Um, yeah. The Christmas the carols, the carols yeah. The Christmas carols was a big, big fundraiser because, you know, we'd be at the club and pack up the van. Somebody would take us, Shay or you or whoever was around. We'd get our Christmas hats on. Um, and we would go and, and sing Christmas carols to people that were having Christmas parties and they would pay us to, you know, right. come and we would use that money to get on the trip. Um, and then the community service project that really always stands out for me was uh, the turkey dinner. Oh, the yeah. Turkey dinner the at the senior, senior center. center. Which, you know, your grandfather, Joe, you know, God rest his soul, great man. You know, he was part of that uh, senior center and I know he enjoyed that a lot. And I mean, that had to be a rewarding thing for you to be able to you know, for a night, serve all those people, as well as your grandfather who made, you know, who meant a lot to you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Just, you know, doing things for others and working hard, I think, is their experiences that sometimes can't be created for kids, and they should be, you know, it, right. it should be. And that's something that the club does. You're going to work hard, and we're going to, you're going to work hard, and you're going to see all the benefits and all of the things that can happen when you work hard, whether it's a trophy at the end of the year or, you know, getting on a trip that you would have never gone on as a 16 year old without your parents. Um, and then again, you know, just learning that there's more to life than just you, and you have to, you know, take time out of your life to give to other people. And that's what right. all those community service projects are about. We're not making money on that. You know, no. but you need to be here because it's important right. uh, for you to give back to a society. And you hear that a lot at the club. You know, we're going to give back to the community. And that's what we're doing here as this group, this youth leadership group. Right. Um, and there was a lot of opportunity for us to do that, being in, right. the, in the Keystone Club. Definitely. You know, one of the things you're brilliant at, at, and I've just noticed it as we've done this interview tonight, is you're good at allowing me to segue into what I want to do. You talked about trophies, and we got to talk about a big trophy, and we got to <laughs> talk about this trophy right here because I believe it was the winter of 2001 in February. Amanda Catella, only a freshman in high school, is told she's won the biggest honor you could ever win at the Boys and Girls Club Girl of the Year. Talk about that moment, and, I mean, I'm sure if I had to guess, knowing your father like I do, He's never one to want to, you know, be in the spotlight. He allowed Shay to tell you the good news. Am I correct? Uh, if I remember correctly, I don't think my father voted on this one. Um, right. And, and I think it was, right. you know, I don't think he, I don't think he put his vote in for me uh, to, to win Girl of the Year. It's amazing. It was amazing to me because I wasn't expecting it being so young. Right. But at this, you know, at the same time, I think 
I was involved in a lot of activities that were going on at the club. Right. And, and so, you know, the I was excited. I was really excited that somebody thought, like, I was somebody who deserved this award. Well, explain the feeling. I mean, it's hard. You're talking about 15 years ago now. Wow, hard to believe. But <laughs> no, right? what was the feeling like, though, when they told you? I mean, were you on cloud nine? I mean, were you able to sleep that night? I mean, you know, I know, like... You take everything in stride. You're not one to ever brag about yourself or talk about yourself. But, I mean, you had to take a little of that in and say, wow, I, I'm girl of the year. This is awesome. I mean, you definitely did, correct? Yeah. I think it really hits not when somebody tells you about, you know, it, I was really proud of myself. Don't get me wrong. But at that point, you're like, oh, I have to write this speech. And, like, you're thinking of all of the things on the day of the ceremony, like when you receive the award and the spotlight's on you and you're giving this speech in front of, you know, 100, 100 people or however many people show up at that night, um, that's when it hits you. Like, wow, you know, everybody's here, they're here. This is the biggest award that you can receive this night um, and all of the hard work when people actually introduce you and talk about all the reasons why it's you, why right. you deserve it. So I think you, re I really felt that, you know, that, amazing feeling the actual night of the award ceremony but i was still so honored you know to hear about it and the, but then i'm thinking like i gotta prepare for this right. um, i'm gonna write my speech what am i gonna say and you're a little nervous and then um then the night of everything comes together and you realize what a big award it is right before we close tonight in part one um we'll get into a lot more in part two again your parents have always been your biggest support system. You know, your father, Mike, your mother, Yoli. I mean, they've always been there for you and your brother. And I know the relationship you have with them is strong today as it was when you two were children. I mean, explain to me how rewarding it was to win Girl of the Year and to be able to share it with two people who have always m meant so much to you. It's... It was amazing. It was amazing to have both of my parents there. Um, they they always supported me, and, and a lot of it comes from them, but it, a lot of it came from the club too, you know, and, and being there. It, w it was awesome to have both of my parents be there on that day, and, you know, for them to say to me, you know, you're, we're so proud of you. Um, and all of the things that you that you are and you know for them to look at me and say you know we know that you deserve this um right it, it just makes you feel again like you can do it like you're gonna be i'm gonna be something someday because i'm something now do you know what i mean exactly like it's, and that's the that's the feeling that i think you know you're proud of yourself like i've done something great here right and do you think uh i mean to me i i've always thought you'd be a success regardless but do you think those years at the Boys and Girls Club, the to doing Torch Club, doing Keystone, you know, playing on the travel team, being in the ceramics room, do you think a lot of it helped prepare you for, you know, what you're doing today? Everything. Yes. It's everything. Nice. I mean, I figured that's what you would say, but, I mean, I could just tell by talking to you tonight that, you know, it definitely played a big role in, you know, your future development. Mm -hmm. Between that, that and the support of my parents, the boys club and the support of my parents is solely the reason why uh, anything that I am today, it all came from that. And that's wonderful. And um, we're going to get into more in part two about Amanda Catella. Amanda, we're going to talk about her years at Southern State Connecticut University. We're also going to tell about her undergraduate success at uh, the University of Fairfield. And then we will also get into Amanda Catella. 10 years later, gets into the Boys and Girls Club Hall of Fame. Until next time, I'm Mike Kanichi for Hometown Hero saying good night, everyone.